9. Luke Hawks 28-year-old Luke Hawks was out of jail on bail when he caught his most serious charges yet in 2022. In an effort to get home before his court-imposed curfew, he sped through a red light and crashed into another car at an intersection. 19-year-old Bethany Branson was thrown from the passenger seat of the vehicle, despite wearing a seatbelt during the crash, and she sadly died from her injuries. Hawks initially fled the scene, but returned a short while later with his mother. He allegedly became irrationally defensive and hostile, telling officers that he hoped he killed someone, and he seemed incredibly drunk, and he smelled strongly of booze. He was arrested for causing Branson's death, and the evidence presented was pretty clear-cut. The accident was captured on surveillance footage as well, which showed the victim's vehicle following traffic laws, while Hawks barreled straight at it. And an investigator estimated he was driving 75 miles per hour, 121 kilometers per hour in a 30 mile per hour, 48 kilometer per hour zone. Hawks admitted to causing death by dangerous driving, and was ordered to serve 10 years in prison. 8. Jose Gilberto Rodriguez Over a week-long period in 2018, the greater Houston area was terrorized by a string of five violent robberies, three of which ended in murder. Four victims were shot, and only one of them survived. Using surveillance footage, investigators quickly suspected 46-year-old Jose Gilberto Rodriguez a parolee who had served 27 years in prison for multiple convictions, including robbery, assault, and auto theft. He was released in 2017 and had established himself as a model parolee while attending required meetings with his parole officer, passing drug tests, and holding down a steady job. That all changed when Rodriguez cut off his ankle monitoring bracelet and disappeared from the halfway house he was staying at. Law enforcement received a tampering notification, but said that there was nothing outwardly suspicious about the monitor's movement, so no red flags were raised. Teresa Williams, who owns the halfway house where Rodriguez was living at the time of the crime spree, told the Houston Chronicle that he was a hard worker, who mainly kept to himself and helped out around the property. She said he went to do laundry one day, but never returned. Rodriguez was taken into custody on capital murder charges, after leading police on a short chase. The outcome of the case is unclear. Hopefully, justice was served. 7. Wendy Jones In April 2021, Las Vegas police officers arrested 23-year-old Wendy Jones for allegedly stealing Rolexes worth tens of thousands of dollars from some men staying in hotel rooms along the famous strip. One victim claimed that he met Jones, who called herself Sarah at a casino. The two drank together, and she encouraged him to keep drinking. At some point, he blacked out. He woke up in a casino valet area and was quickly taken to the hospital. The man suspected he had been drugged, and his $45,000 Rolex was missing from his wrist. Just days before, another man met an attractive woman named Sarah at a casino and invited her back to his room. At some point, he fell asleep and when he woke up, she was gone, along with his $45,000 Rolex and iPhone. The victim told police it was unusual for him to suddenly fall asleep, making him believe he had been drugged. A few weeks before this incident, a man was visiting Vegas and met a woman calling herself Rosa at a bar. They went back to his room together and ordered drinks. Rosa insisted on him finishing his margarita, he fell asleep shortly after and was out cold until 10.30 a.m., which was unusual for him. The man also said he felt drowsy and sore and was missing his $37,000 watch and $1,500 in cash. Jones was finally busted for the thefts and was hit with three counts of felony grand larceny. 6. Daria Brown a 22-year-old woman from Iowa named Daria Brown went viral in 2022 for her behavior during an arrest. Police in Iowa City encountered the young woman in a visibly upset state, hitting on a bar's windows from outside. Brown allegedly admitted to assaulting an employee, 
and while the bar wasn't going to press charges, she was arrested for her combative behavior toward responding officers. Body cam footage showed the woman refusing to cooperate, even after being handcuffed and kicking at the cops as they tried putting her in the back of a squad car. Brown was accused of trying to steal an officer's taser and assaulting three others. But after seeing a cop strike Brown repeatedly in the back during the body cam video, some people wondered if the police were too harsh on her. That wasn't the case, though, according to law enforcement, who told local news station KCRG that Brown has a history of being belligerent toward police. In fact, at the time of her arrest, she was on probation for a similar incident. In 2018, she admitted to hitting a cop car and resisting arrest. She had also assaulted a hospital staff member and resisted arrest in a separate incident. The following year, she pleaded guilty to an operating while intoxicated charge and for refusing to cooperate with police. And several months before her most recent arrest, Brown allegedly tried to bite a hospital security guard and punched a staff member. She seems to have avoided news headlines since, a hopeful sign that she's straightened out. 5. Harvey Marcellin In 2022, 68-year-old Susan Layden's dismembered torso was found in a shopping cart in Brooklyn, New York, the day after she was reported missing. Four days later, someone found her leg in a random pile of trash on a sidewalk. Police quickly connected the crime to 83-year-old ex-con Harvey Marcellin, a transgender woman who had previously served time for killing two of their girlfriends. Marcellin's criminal records date back to 1957, beginning with assault and gambling charges. She was paroled in 1984 for fatally shooting someone in 1963. Then, in 1985, a year after her release, she stabbed another woman to death and dumped her body near Central Park. The serial killer was paroled in 2019, less than three years before Layden's murder. Social media revealed that the suspect and her latest victim had interactions online a year before the murder. Marcellin seemed infatuated with Layden, whose family and friends have said it was uncharacteristic for Susan to associate with someone with such a checkered past. Like many people, they've been left wondering how someone who killed twice was set free and given an opportunity to strike a third time. Cops found the victim's severed head inside Marcellin's apartment, along with a bloody mop and an electric saws box. They uncovered surveillance footage that showed her disposing of Layden's leg, and security video also showed the victim entering, but not leaving, the suspect's apartment building. A medical examiner concluded that Layden died from blunt force trauma to the head, and determined it was a homicide. Marcellin was charged with concealment of a human corpse and second-degree murder. She pleaded not guilty, and the case seems to be ongoing. 4. Elizabeth Long It's a situation that's become all too familiar in recent years. A delivery truck pulls away from a house, an unrecognized car pulls up a little while later, and the driver gets out and snatches the resident's packages off the front step. A 37-year-old woman from Yakima, Washington, named Elizabeth Long, was identified as one of these so-called porch pirates in 2016 after being caught in the act on a doorbell camera. At the time, Long was already wanted on a felony arrest warrant. After dealing with her criminal cases and being released from custody, she allegedly struck once again during the 2017 holiday season. And for the second time, Doorbell security cameras filmed her stealing packages. As soon as police saw the footage, they immediately recognized her, according to Sergeant David Cortez, who spoke with the Yakima Herald during their latest search for Long. Cortez said that the car seen in the footage matched the vehicle they found in Long's driveway, and that they found some stolen property at her home as well. She was eventually charged with third-degree possession of stolen property. 3. Simon Mellors in 1999, Simon Mellors fatally beat and strangled his lover, 36-year-old mother of two, Pearl Black, at their home in Nottingham, England. He was sent to prison for 14 years, but his sentence was reduced. In 2011, he was released after serving just 12 years. 
Black's family warned the parole board that Mellors would strike again, but they granted him freedom anyway. In 2018, he stabbed 51-year-old Janet Scott and ran her over with his car because she wanted to end their relationship. She died in the street, and Mellors tried to kill an officer who rushed to Scott's aid. He was charged with murder and attempted murder. An inquest found that his probation officer failed to keep proper records on Mellor's relationships with women after his release. Just days before committing his second murder, the ex-con himself warned probation about his stalking tendencies. By then, he had already started following Scott to her workplace and had even gotten a job with the same employer, asking to be transferred to the location where Scott worked. A mental health nurse contacted probation about Meller's behavior out of concern for Scott's safety, but apparently nothing was ever done. There was also evidence of parole violations, which should have caught the attention of multiple law enforcement agencies and put Mellors back in prison. He decided to take his own life while awaiting trial for the murder. 2. Julianne O'Farrell A serial thief from Cork, Ireland, named Julianne O'Farrell, has so many convictions under her belt that it's hard to keep track. By 2019, she had 111 previous convictions, including 26 for theft. She was even caught stealing from a nearby business during a court lunch break. She had given birth just six weeks earlier, but apparently becoming a mother wasn't enough to change her ways. After being arrested, O'Farrell allegedly told a cop, I was fleecing the city for years before you ever caught me. Her defense attorney claimed his client was going through a rough time after the death of her partner. But by then, O'Farrell had demonstrated a clear pattern of behavior dating much farther back. The judge sentenced her to 10 months in prison for the lunchtime thefts. But as soon as she was released, she went right back to stealing. By early 2023, O'Farrell's ever-lengthening rap sheet had jumped to 227 convictions, including 74 for stealing. As her crimes continue, her sentences have started landing her in prison for longer terms each time. 1. Jack Heinrich In late 2022, 33-year-old Jack D. Heinrich broke into a Salvation Army chapel in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota where he piled up a few winter coats that were donated to people in need and set them on fire, causing thousands of dollars worth of property damage. NBA player Chet Holmgren donated coats to replace the ones destroyed, and Heinrich pleaded guilty to second-degree arson. He was sentenced to probation, which required him to get mental health treatment and to abstain from using guns, drugs, or alcohol. The seemingly lenient punishment came despite Heinrich's repeated arrests before and after the arson, including allegations of fighting with police, as well as theft and disorderly conduct. Just days after his sentencing, he was accused of smashing windows with beer bottles at a local pub, causing $1,000 in damages. A few weeks later, a bail charity paid $3,000 to get him released from jail. The next day, Heinrich allegedly trashed a coffee shop, causing terrified customers and employees to run for cover. Several people locked themselves in the bathrooms out of fear for their safety, and at least one person thought there was an active shooter. Heinrich left $8,000 worth of damage in this rampage, which left one employee so traumatized that she was afraid to return to work for several days. He had been kicked out of the shop earlier that day, too, and returned with an apparent desire for vengeance. So far, the only jail time Heinrich has actually served has been while waiting to resolve each of his criminal cases. He faces multiple charges of felony burglary and property damage in connection to the coffee shop incident. Police inspector Elliot Faust criticized the bail charity that helped him, telling the Star Tribune that while he understands the premise of why they do what they do, it defeats the purpose of what bail is truly meant for in the first place if someone blindly throws money at any old case. Number 9. Caitlin O'Brien and Shea Sturt 31-year-old Caitlin O'Brien was well aware that her decade-long relationship with Shea Sturt was toxic, 
but the young Australian woman's repeated attempts to escape him were unsuccessful. As much as she wanted to get away from the violence Sturt subjected her to, she couldn't seem to fully let go. It was reportedly common for O'Brien, who worked as a nurse, to show up at her job in Melbourne crying and with visible injuries from the couple's latest fight. And by the time things took a deadly turn, the courtroom had become a familiar place for her and Sturt. During one incident back in 2010, she suggested that Sturt might need mental help for his temper, and he responded by punching her in the head several times. On another occasion, Sturt struck O'Brien during a disagreement about furniture. Over the years, O'Brien sought medical help at least 30 times for injuries allegedly caused by her partner, and the police were called often enough to most likely be on a first-name basis with the couple. But there were limits to what the justice system could do to separate the pair, especially since O'Brien often withdrew her complaint or dropped charges against her boyfriend. In other instances, Sturt suffered only minor consequences for his behavior. Meanwhile, his psychological state went from paranoid and hostile to dangerously delusional, and his worsening mental issues went untreated. O'Brien finally made the decision to leave for good when Sturt had a violent psychotic episode that caused her to fear for her life. While he was detained in the mental ward, she contacted an ex and asked if she could stay with him, and she stressed that it was an emergency. But he didn't pick up on the urgency of the matter and instead told O'Brien to wait a few days to be sure of her decision. It was during that window of time that Sturt was released from the hospital. He went straight to O'Brien's apartment and a brutal struggle ensued. Caitlin did her best to try fighting Sturt off, but he overpowered her and stabbed her multiple times with a pair of scissors before smothering her to death with a pillow. Less than 36 hours earlier, Sturt had promised never to hurt his girlfriend. And while O'Brien wanted to believe he had the best of intentions, there were signs that something dangerous would inevitably happen if she didn't get away from him. Even if Caitlin didn't notice the red flags firsthand, other people saw the writing on the wall. Unfortunately, by the time the authorities locked Sturt up for any meaningful length of time, Caitlin was dead. The only reassuring takeaway from this senseless tragedy is the fact that he'll spend at least 22 years behind bars before he sees freedom again. Number 8. Hamburg Church Shooting in early 2023, officials from Germany's Weapons Control Authority received an anonymous letter from a concerned civilian. The civilian suspected a 35-year-old former Jehovah's Witness from Hamburg named Philipp Fuzz of being mentally unstable. According to the letter, Fuzz seemed angry with fellow members of his church, and they were worried that he would take drastic action against them. More specifically, the note warned that Fuzz might be suffering from an undiagnosed mental illness and that he harbored anger specifically against the Jehovah's Witnesses and his former employer. Authorities visited Fuzz, but found no reason to take away his gun, the same gun he used to commit a horrific shooting during a service at a local Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall two months later. Police rushed to the scene, but by the time they got there, four men and two women between the ages of 33 and 60 were dead. Eight others were injured, including four victims who sustained serious injuries. Fuzz, who had reportedly left the church 18 months earlier, then turned the gun on himself before members of the local special forces team could apprehend him. Although Fuzz left the church voluntarily, his departure apparently did not occur on good terms. But people are more concerned over why his gun wasn't taken away, rather than his falling out with the congregation. Fuzz was reportedly cooperative during the visit to his house two months before the shooting, and the authorities left after issuing a verbal warning to him for not keeping a bullet locked up in his safe. During a press conference, police chief Ralph Martin Meyer said that Fuzz had no criminal record and that law enforcement had no legal grounds to revoke his gun. At the scene, investigators uncovered a backpack full of ammunition. A search of the gunman's apartment turned up 15 loaded magazines with 15 cartridges each and four boxes of ammunition containing 200 cartridges. While many believe the deadly shooting could have and should have been prevented, Maya credited the quick police response for preventing even more lives from being lost. Number 7. South Korea Crowd Crush 
After enduring more than two years of life in lockdown and other COVID-19 related restrictions that prevented large crowds from gathering in Korea, an estimated 100,000 people went out in downtown Seoul to celebrate Halloween in 2022. It was the first post-pandemic Halloween party in the country's capital, and after being cooped up at home for so long, people were ready to let loose. Early on in the evening, police began receiving calls from concerned partygoers who noticed that the crowd was becoming dangerously congested. Fearing a deadly stampede or a crowd crush, callers urged law enforcement to report to the scene and help get things under control. But nobody came, and the conditions only became more cramped as more and more people shoved their way into a narrow alley. Hours after the first emergency call was placed, the exact thing the emergency callers were trying to prevent from happening occurred. A massive crowd crush, which resulted in the deaths of at least 156 people. Another 172 people were hurt, including at least 33 partygoers who suffered from serious injuries. Afterward, authorities claimed that they didn't receive their first call for help until after 10 o'clock p.m., around the time of the crush. But records showed that they received calls as early as 6.34 p.m., nearly four hours earlier. In the tragedy's aftermath, Korean Prime Minister Han duk Su called for an investigation into law enforcement's failure to act sooner, which would have undoubtedly saved lives. Number 6. Casey Brittle and Sanchez Williams 21-year-old Casey Brittle was beaten to death in 2011 after suffering for years at the hands of her daughter's father, 27-year-old Sanchez Williams. The couple's child witnessed the brutality firsthand, and Williams allegedly sat and did nothing for two hours while the young mother laid unconscious at their home in Nottinghamshire, England. Sadly, there were at least 11 missed opportunities over a two-year period for authorities to take action against Williams, which would have arguably spared Casey Brittle's life. In addition to the couple's well-known history of domestic incidents, Williams had a lengthy rap sheet that demonstrated his capacity to be violent. Following Brittle's murder, authorities accused the police of failing to take even the most basic measures to protect the victim. This failure was partially blamed on Brittle's tendency to downplay her boyfriend's abuse, something she reportedly did because she feared he would inflict even worse harm against her if she told law enforcement the full truth. Some might say that it was easy to pick up on this fear based on Brittle's reluctance to press charges against Williams. Yet police failed to question why the young woman called them repeatedly and then hesitated, according to an incident report. After being found guilty of Brittle's murder and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 15 years, it'll be a long time before Williams can harm another woman. But many believe that Brittle's death could have been prevented if law enforcement had simply picked up on the obvious signs that she desperately needed their protection. Number 5. The Murder of Rashim Carter A 25-year-old African-American father named Rashim Carter was last seen at a motel in Laurel, Mississippi in October of 2022. Just a day earlier, he had gone to the Taylorsville Police Department and reported that several men were after him. He also told his mom, Tiffany, that three trucks with white men were chasing him and yelling racial slurs, and he made it clear that he believed his life was in danger. Tiffany later said that Carter had fled from his workplace after a disagreement with a co-worker. When Carter failed to materialize, his concerned loved ones reported him missing. About a month after his disappearance, his severed head was found in a remote wooded area. The rest of his remains were found elsewhere. Someone obviously did something terrible and evil to Rashim, and his family wants justice, but they feel like law enforcement has failed to take meaningful action. The Smith County Sheriff's Office has said that there's no reason to suspect foul play in Carter's death, and reportedly told the family that wild animals may have torn Carter's body apart. Tiffany and Rashim's other loved ones are now calling for a federal investigation into what appears to them to be a needless tragedy. The family is represented by prominent attorney Ben Crump, who said during a press conference in early 2023 that the Carters believe law enforcement is trying to sweep Rashim's murder under the rug. They also believe he was the victim of a hate crime based on the things he told them shortly before his death. 
Crump implored the U.S. Department of Justice to take action where state and local authorities are failing to do so, and to investigate the disturbing incident which he described as a Mississippi lynching as a civil rights case. Laurel Police Chief Tommy Cox told NBC News that his department took the initial missing persons report about Carter, but denied that Rasheem had gone to the agency seeking help. Cox also said that the department handed the case over to the Smith County Sheriff's Office shortly after the report was filed because it was outside their jurisdiction, but that he believed his officers tried to do the right thing and looked into the case to the extent that they could. In addition to what seems to many like a lack of concern on behalf of the Smith County Sheriff's Office over Carter's death, there are lingering unanswered questions, including why authorities chose to search the area where they found his remains. The cause of his death also remains unclear. According to Tiffany Carter, her son was coherent and did not seem to be under the influence of drugs or alcohol during their last conversations. The Mississippi Bureau of Investigation has joined the probe, but declined to comment, citing the ongoing nature of the case. In the meantime, Rashim's family, friends, and young daughter are left to carry on without him. They are left without knowing exactly what happened to him, and if anyone who might have been involved will ever face justice. Number 4. Senseless Gym Shooting of Military Veteran a 34-year-old United States Marine named Harrison Bordenov was working out at a gym in Opelousas, Louisiana in early 2023 when a man later identified as 34-year-old Jason Lede approached him. The two men exchanged some words, and for reasons that aren't particularly clear, Lede allegedly told Bordenov, you don't need all that cardio because cardio is not going to help you outrun a bullet. Bordenov's cousin Ron Haley later told local station KLFY that Lede approached Bordenov again just a few weeks later and hurled racial slurs at him. Haley said that his cousin filed a police report over the incident, but that law enforcement didn't take the complaint seriously. He even claimed that one officer looked at Bordenov's U.S. Marines tattoo and made a comment alluding to him having post-traumatic stress disorder and overreacting. Feeling as though the police responded inadequately to the report, Bordenov's mother, Charlotte, tried to take surveillance footage of her son's interactions with Lede to the police station. Less than 24 hours later, someone approached Bordenov at the gym and shot him in the chest at point-blank range. He died from his injuries. Police arrested Lede on suspicion of murder, something that Bordenov's loved ones believe could have been prevented if law enforcement had taken more action upon receiving his initial complaint. Charlotte Bordenov also thinks that the authorities should have looked into Lede's extensive criminal history, which she believes reflects his capacity to be violent. Speaking with KLFY, she said, Shame on you. Do better. Do better by the citizens you're sworn to protect and serve. It should not come to this. It should not come to the death of a person for your job to be done. The investigation is ongoing. Number 3. A Woman's Worst Nightmare in early 2023, roughly 30 years after enduring a horrifying, life-changing experience that she believes she never saw justice for, a 43-year-old Australian woman named Karen Isles came forward publicly to tell her story. At the time of the incident back in 1993, she and a friend had travelled from New South Wales to Queensland's Gold Coast for a family beach vacation. While they were there, a group of 15 men nearly twice their age began talking to Karen and invited her to come have lunch where they were staying. In hindsight, she realized they were grooming her, but as a naive teenager, she didn't know any better. Once she got there, one of the men pushed her into a room and assaulted her, while the rest of the group looked on and eventually joined in. During an interview with news.com.au three decades later, Karen described their behavior as very orchestrated and methodical. In other words, the crime seemed clearly planned out. When the horrific attack was finally over, the young woman ran back to her family and best friend and continued the day as planned, doing her best to act like nothing was wrong. She didn't tell her family what happened, but they noticed a dramatic change in her behavior. After years of suspecting that something was deeply wrong, her concerned loved ones read her diary and learned about the assault. They encouraged Karen to press charges, but she still blamed herself and wasn't ready to go to the police. 
Finally, during an International Women's Day march in 2004, she realized that the assault wasn't her fault. She went to the Newtown police with her diary and described in detail what had happened, right down to the exact date, time, and place the incident occurred. Karen also provided the names of another victim and a witness. Law enforcement reassured her that they would launch a multi-agency investigation into the case, but the probe quickly ground to a halt. Nearly two decades later, she is still trying to figure out why the case was closed just one week after she made the report, and why her statement was fed to a paper shredder in 2018. Over the last 19 years, she says she has tried desperately and to no avail to persuade the police to take action. Karen said that her interactions with authorities have only added to the trauma of the assault that she suffered from to begin with. She's now campaigning for new laws in Australia that would require officers to thoroughly investigate these types of assaults and would hold them accountable if they fail to follow through on this duty. Number 2. The Arrest of Karen Garner when employees saw an elderly woman leave a Walmart store in Loveland, Colorado, with unpaid merchandise one day in 2020, they confronted her in the parking lot. The woman, later identified as 73-year-old Karen Garner, was carrying $14 worth of items, including a t-shirt, candy, and soda. She allegedly offered to pay for the goods, but the workers wouldn't let her. Instead, they took the items back and called the police. In the meantime, Karen walked away from the scene. Staff members and local authorities didn't know that she suffers from dementia and sensory aphasia, which sometimes affects her ability to understand language comprehension. While responding to the call, Officer Austin Hopp found Karen picking wildflowers on the side of the road. In a video of the encounter, Hopp could be heard telling the senior citizen to stop as he approached her on foot. Karen glanced back at him with a seemingly confused expression on her face, then continued walking with her freshly picked batch of flowers. Hop almost immediately grabbed Karen's arms from behind, then took the 80-pound, 36-kilogram septuagenarian to the ground and handcuffed her. The terror in her voice was evident as she insisted to the officer that she was on her way home and didn't do anything wrong. With help from fellow officer Daria Jalali, who could have tried to intervene on what many would later describe as a clear display of excessive force, Hop hogtied Karen and forced her into a squad car. When a bystander questioned the cop's aggressive behavior, Hop told the person to go away and that it was none of their business. A police station surveillance camera later captured Hop, Jalali, and a third officer, Tyler Blackett, laughing and fist bumping each other while reviewing body cam footage of the arrest. Hop could be heard describing Garner as senile and admitting that he dislocated her shoulder and failed to administer her Miranda rights. All three officers resigned when the case fell under public scrutiny. Hop was sentenced to five years in prison for assault after taking a plea deal, and Jalali received a 45-day jail sentence for misconduct and for failing to intervene on or report Hop's use of excessive force. Garner was left with lasting physical damage, including limited use of her left arm. Her family sued the city and the officers involved on her behalf for using excessive force and failing to provide medical care, and received a $3 million settlement. But it won't solve the trauma she endured or heal her injuries. Number 1. Scott Shepard and Conrad Gagner in July of 2022, officials in the small city of Cottage Grove, Oregon, launched an investigation into the alleged misconduct of the local police chief, Scott Shepard, and former police captain, Conrad Gagner. The city's leaders declined to comment to the press on the nature of the allegations against the pair, who resigned from their positions just days after being put on administrative leave. In early 2023, the Register Guard revealed the details of several complaints that were lodged against Shepard and Gagner around the time of the investigation. Getting their hands on the material wasn't easy, but they finally obtained the information through a public records request that was granted to another local publication, The Chronicle, after they were initially denied and appealed the decision. According to the documents, Gagner was accused of using racial and homophobic slurs in the workplace and posting inappropriate and offensive content on social media, and Shepard allegedly failed to do anything about it. The findings also claimed that the pair were guilty of other misconduct and unprofessional behavior, including failing to run the local jail properly and failing to assist other local law enforcement agencies. 
Even after the limited details of the situation were made public, the city's manager, Richard Myers, failed to respond to a request for a comment. In the initial notices issued to Shepard and Gagner about their potential termination, he wrote that their actions placed the city at risk of unneeded liability and described their behavior as extremely unacceptable. From what little information is available, it seems as though there were some serious breaches of professionalism within the agency, which is under the command of Interim Chief Jeff Groth, and it's most likely only a matter of time before journalists uncover more details about the scandal that the agency seems determined to keep quiet. Nine, Joseph Kennedy. Most people would agree that nobody deserves to die just for stealing. But in the mind of 67-year-old Joseph Lloyd Kennedy II from Okmulgee, Oklahoma, this severe punishment made perfect sense. He quickly became a suspect after the dismembered bodies of four men were discovered in a river near the scrapyard he owned back in 2022. Surveillance footage and cell phone location data put Kennedy at the location, where authorities believe the victims were killed, at the exact time they think the murders happened. Prosecutors revealed that there was also DNA evidence linking him to the crime. Perhaps the most damning argument against Kennedy, though, is his alleged confession to a friend that he shot the men because they were stealing from him. According to court documents, Kennedy said he simply lost it and started shooting before cutting the bodies up afterward. In a police interview earlier on in the case, the suspect admitted that he thought the victims were stealing, but claimed he had no contact with them. Kennedy was finally picked up by police in Florida for driving a stolen pickup truck and extradited back to Oklahoma. He now faces four counts of premeditated first-degree murder and is behind bars on a $10 million bond. 8. Crystal Sinclair In 2016, a 29-year-old Florida woman named Crystal Sinclair was frustrated with how long it was taking to bring her alleged stalker to justice. One night, the Osceola County Sheriff's Office got word that Sinclair was on the way to 65-year-old John Casameno's home with a handgun and plans to confront him herself. Sheriff's deputies and officers with the Deland Police Department started searching for Sinclair and stationed themselves outside Casamento's home. After a failed attempt at pulling her over, they used spike strips to stop her car. Sinclair allegedly spat on, swore at, and kicked her arresting officers. She was charged with fleeing and eluding police, battery on a law enforcement agent, resisting an officer with violence, as well as drug-related crimes. John Casamento told the Daytona Beach News Journal, that he knew Sinclair, but wasn't stalking her at all. Despite his claims, records revealed that he had been accused of stalking others in the past. He said that they met four months earlier when he sold her a boat, and that Sinclair had worked for his boat selling business for a short period. According to Casameno, his most recent contact with the woman happened weeks before her arrest, when he texted her to ask where he should drop off some of her belongings. It's unclear what the end result of this case was, Hopefully, whoever was at fault was punished. 7. Salih Hafiz In recent years, Lebanon has descended into a full-blown financial crisis, putting about 80% of its population below the poverty line and leaving many people hungry and in need of relief. Things have gotten so bad that some banks reportedly blocked locals from accessing their own money. Determined to get her hands on the $13,000 she had in a savings account, a woman named Salih Hafiz and some friends held up a bank in Beirut towards the end of 2022. She briefly took everyone inside the bank hostage with what she later claimed was just a toy gun, then left with her hard-earned money. Around the same time, a man carried out a similar holdup situation in the mountain city of Alay before turning himself into the police. A month earlier, another individual had to demand a bank withdrawal at gunpoint in order to get money from his account so he could pay for his sick father's medical treatment. Before going into hiding, Hafiz claimed she went through with the heist for a similar reason, to help pay for her sister who has cancer. 
she told the press that she had tried to withdraw money two days earlier. After several weeks on the run, Hafiz surrendered. She was released on bail and hit with a six-month travel ban while her case proceeded in court. Since then, the holdups haven't stopped, and unlike most crimes, they're being met with widespread public praise. After all, it's hard to have a problem with someone demanding what's rightfully theirs to take, especially when so many can relate to the suffering driving these people to such extreme measures. 6. Battered Wife Saves Herself A Louisiana housewife who went well out of her way to make her husband happy found herself in danger when he suddenly snapped one day in 2017. By then, the man had a history of verbally abusing his wife, but the woman never expected him to actually kick her, throw things at her, or pee on her like he did that fateful day. She said that her spouse got angry after she refused to back him up during a fight he picked at a local gas station. Things got ugly as soon as the couple got home. They went back to the station to discuss the fight, at which point the woman begged a man who was putting gas in his truck to drive her somewhere safe. When she saw her husband leave the gas station, she panicked, got into the truck, and drove it to the Baton Rouge Police Department herself. Her husband chased after her in his car. Outside the station, he got out of his vehicle and held onto the truck in an attempt to pull his wife out. In her desperation to get away from him, the woman smashed through the department's gate and kept driving until she saw an officer in the middle of a traffic stop. While she drove over to them, her husband fell off the truck and was fatally run over. Authorities decided not to charge the wife, who was left with both physical injuries and emotional trauma after the devastating ordeal. 5. Reese Davies and Tara McKenna In early 2019, Reese Davies got into a fight of sorts with a man named Calum Holden and ended up with a stab wound. In a bid for revenge, Davies and his girlfriend, Tara McKenna, went after Holden and his lover, Jessica Williams, by chasing after them with a machete through the English village of Thornton Cleveleys. The victims were getting out of their car when Davies and McKenna came up. Davies kicked the side view mirror and shouted that Holden was a dead man. Williams quickly sped off in the vehicle while Holden escaped to his mother's house on foot, where he called the police and told Williams to come home. When the young woman got out of the car, McKenna approached and threatened her again. As soon as Holden came out from inside his mom's house, Davies chased after him with the machete. In the meantime, McKenna started swinging at Williams with a makeshift weapon, a piece of wood with nails in it. They fell to the ground and began wrestling. McKenna and Davies both punched Williams in the head. Soon, bystanders noticed the scene and came over to help, causing the perpetrators to flee the scene. Davies and McKenna claimed the victims made the story up, but the court ruled otherwise the judge imposed suspended sentences while cautioning the pair that they only narrowly avoided jail time. 4. Roger and Anthony Bilodeau In early 2020, 39-year-old Jacob Sansom and his uncle, 57-year-old Maurice Cardinal, were out moose hunting in Glendon, Alberta, Canada, when they briefly pulled into the driveway of a home where Roger Bilodeau and his son Joseph lived. Concerned that the truck was being driven by thieves who wanted to rob them, Roger and Joseph got into their own car and chased after it. Reaching nearly 100 miles an hour, 161 kilometers per hour during the chase. In the middle of the pursuit, Roger called his elder son, Anthony, who lived next door, and instructed him to bring over a gun. Roger pulled in front of the truck he was after and stopped, forcing the pickup to stop as well. Surveillance footage later showed that the interactions between the two parties lasted less than 30 seconds before Anthony shot Cardinal and Sansom, who died on the road. When questioned by investigators, the Bilodos denied having any knowledge or involvement in the shooting. After discovering contrary evidence, authorities charged Roger and Anthony with murder. The men argued in court that they acted in self-defense, but the prosecution maintained that Cardinal and Sansom were the ones who had to defend themselves from danger. 
Anthony was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to life with a minimum of 13 years. And Roger is serving a 10-year sentence for manslaughter. 3. Matthew Golden Early one morning in 2018, authorities in Iowa put out an amber alert for two missing children in a silver Hyundai Sonata with Illinois license plates. While driving down Interstate 80, a driver named Matthew Golden spotted a white van with Florida plates and somehow mistook it for the Amber Alert vehicle. Instead of reporting the sighting to the police and trailing the vehicle from a safe distance, which is what people should do in response to Amber Alerts, Golden allegedly rammed the white van repeatedly. According to law enforcement, Golden then approached the van with his personal gun and ordered commands before shooting at the vehicle twice. He soon learned how big of a mistake he made. The driver of the van was a Florida resident named T.C. Smith, who was simply on his way to visit family in Illinois. Altoona Police Chief Greg Stallman told local station WHO 13 that nothing about Golden's response to the alert was correct or justified. Inside his vehicle, officers found two more handguns, as well as some marijuana. Golden reportedly stripped down to his underwear before his arrest, but police aren't sure why. They concluded that he was not under the influence at the time. He was charged with possessing an illegal substance, intimidation, and two counts of assault. Two, Billy McGillicuddy. In recent years, community members in the Canadian village of McAdam have faced rising issues with vandalism, thefts, and other property crimes. Residents became so frustrated that when 41-year-old Billy McGillicuddy took the problem into his own hands and got arrested, dozens of people went to court in his support, including the village's mayor. The incident happened in June 2022, when McGillicuddy approached an alleged meth dealer named Blake Scott at his friend's house and hit the man with a metal bat. McGillicuddy apparently suspected Scott of being responsible for some of the recent crimes in the area, and he also accused the man of inappropriately looking at his daughter. Scott later told police that he wanted to clear up the misunderstanding, so he contacted a mutual friend of his and McGillicuddy's named Dwayne Gardner, who invited him over that day. When Scott arrived, he was ordered to sit in a chair, and Gardner allegedly pointed a sawed-off shotgun at him. McGillicuddy then came and roughed Scott up, throwing him to the ground and kneeing him before assaulting him with a chair. He told Scott to strip naked and get into the back of his truck. After taking his clothes off, Scott decided to make a run for it and went to a neighbor who called the police. Police charged McGillicuddy in connection with the incident, and the community was quick to rally around him believing he was left with no choice but to take matters into his own hands. Scott admitted that he had previously served time for breaking and entering, but that it was in his past. He said he wasn't doing anything wrong leading up to the encounter with McGillicuddy. He also insisted that he had simply nodded hello to McGillicuddy's daughter while walking along a path, but that he was just being polite and didn't say or do anything overly inappropriate. The court sentenced McGillicuddy to 18 months in jail for unlawful confinement and assault with a weapon. And talks with local leaders and law enforcement about how to get crime under control are reportedly still happening. 1. Jack Martinelli and Christopher Azar In 2014, when a group of friends saw a man punch a woman in Melbourne, Australia early one morning, they immediately went to check on her before moving her out of the street. They went after her alleged attacker, Ashley Rafati, and what started as a verbal confrontation quickly escalated to physical blows. Rafati swung and missed Jack Martinelli, who punched him back, knocking him to the ground. Martinelli's friend, Christopher Azar, then kicked Rafati after he fell. The beating continued, with Martinelli and Azar apparently unaware Rafati had lost consciousness. He survived, but was left hard of hearing with a lengthy recovery period, so police arrested the suspects. In court, Martinelli's lawyer insisted his client was deeply sorry for what he described as a bad error of judgment in an emotionally charged environment. 
The attorney also pointed out how Martinelli apologized to Rafati without blaming alcohol for his behavior, like people have been known to do after these types of encounters in the past. Azar also expressed remorse for his behavior. The judge acknowledged that Rafati threw the first punch, but the defendant's reaction to it was beyond unacceptable. She also mentioned how Martinelli and Azar would have likely been hailed as heroes for helping the young woman if only they hadn't gone on to commit a brutal assault. The men managed to avoid convictions on the contingency of staying out of legal trouble for two years, paying fines, and going to a positive lifestyle course. Thanks for watching. Would you rather serve a year in jail for vigilante justice with overwhelming support from the public? Would you rather serve a year in jail for vigilante justice with overwhelming support from the public or avoid a jail sentence but face widespread criticism for your actions? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. See you soon. Bye.